Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lighting Essentials. We're chatting with Gary Crabb, uh, Enlightened Images. And uh, about a week ago, Gary made a post on what he calls the, uh, it was uh, the iconic photo of the trophy shot, a nature and landscape photographer's dilemma. And he posed a very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, and you can see it right here on the screen. This is Zabriskie Point with photographers all lined up to take the same shot. Um, it, it, it's a very lively discussion. And uh, let's welcome Gary to the to the show. Gary, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me today. Well, you, uh, you sure uh, hit some hot buttons, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and um, hopefully with a, a good discussion resulting, I'm uh, happy to have hit those buttons. Well, this um, tell me tell me about this shot that you have here. Uh, you you kind of I'm not I don't want to read this uh, here, but um, Zabriskie Point is an iconic photograph of Death Valley. I mean, if you're going to go and shoot Death Valley, it's almost like you really want to do it. But at the same time, does it? Do you think that it loses its value if everybody has one? Is that a fair well, question? Yeah, that's that is a very fair question, and you know, um, it seems to be you know uh, a lot of the national parks and um, other renowned spots that have become kind of the postcard classic locations and Zabriskie Point happens to be one of Death Valley's classic postcard locations and these locations become iconic because they are beautiful um, they're naturally um, attractive and they're used repeatedly in calendars and postcards and magazines and when you go to the visitor center at these parts uh, you're inundated with those images because this is like the defining image for a particular location and Zabriskie Point is probably the you know one of maybe three that really just says Death Valley and so everyone that goes there, they, they want to have Death Valley. And photographers that come to visit, you know, they've got a short list of the things they want to go and places they want to photograph, um, especially if they're coming from a long distance. And Zabriskie Point is always at the top of the list. And I don't know of any photo tours that go to Death Valley and don't bring their clients to Zabriskie Point. That's it. it's interesting. I've, I've been to Zabriskie Point once. I've been to Death Valley many times, but I've always sort of stayed away. I've only been there one time. It's the middle of August, and it was the middle of the day, so the light was just really, you know, terrible. Um, and uh, hold on for a moment, Gary. I gotta, sure. I'm gonna, I gotta get someone at the door here. I'm gonna come. Over. And we're back. I had, uh, I had my. Uh, the Hobbit, the Hobbit Unexpected Journey was just, was just delivered to my house. Yay! Oh, how cool. I love that movie. Gosh, I do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, I, you may get a knock on my door, too, because I'm waiting for my D800 to come back from Nikon repair. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, uh, you know, I had the worst light of the day. I'm standing on Zabriskie Point, and I'm looking out there, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't even, I didn't at the time even take a shot because it really was so bad um, that it wouldn't have worked anyway. Um, but it's, it, your, your um, post got me thinking about how many times I struggle with the, um, the whole idea of the iconic image. Do I take it? Do I, do I make the uh, image, uh, even though it's it's been done a thousand times, and and I find myself not wanting to take those images, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah. I wonder if I'm missing out. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, I would say yes. You, you probably are in some regard, and um, this was actually 
stems from a conversation I was having offline with a number of other photographers um, through a private forum and we were talking about this because it is the oft great debate especially for some of the more experienced or professional level landscape photographers um, in terms of where do we spend our time and how do we focus our artistic efforts and so this discussion was coming up about the icons and you know whether they're worth shooting and some people are vehemently I'm just gonna avoid them because they've been done a thousand times before and just like anything in life I think a blanket black and white statement um, yes doesn't really serve the individual purpose that well because certainly even if you've been to an iconic location before it's still possible to make some really great and stunning unique captures from them and so they don't necessarily have to be avoided I think what some of the people are objecting to more now is the zoo factor you know and that you're actually at some of these locations forced to line up with hundreds of or you know dozens to as you said, <laughs> hundreds of photographers at, at a particular location at a particular time everyone trying to vie for the same shot and that does I mean especially for nature photographers who love solitude you know the idea of being out in nature is you know to be one with nature is to appreciate that solitude and the getting together in a group to photograph an iconic location especially when you're being crowded in um, is about as contrary to the idea of a artistic purpose or personal goal as you could have so I think it kind of boiled down to and the consensus is, you know, we feel is that, you know, it, it's okay to go shoot an iconic location. If you haven't been there before, go get the shot. You know, that's what everyone really wants. They want their own version. Um, and, and whether they're called what we might deem as trophy hunters, um, we liken it to like the, the old African hunter that he's got the boar's head, the lion's head, the hippo's head, the rhino's head, mm -hmm. you know, and you can picture this old library study with wooden walls and all these dead animal heads representing their particular trophy shots. Well, nature photographers, um, by and large as a group, have seen, especially among landscape photographers, have seemed to become that same kind of herd mentality that, oh, if they've got it on their wall it's worth me go getting on my wall and you know far be it from it's <laughs> going and getting a shot of half dome or the grand canyon or zabriskie point is far better in my mind than going out and shooting a hippo or a rhino or a lion yep but the the drive seems to be the same it's whether you know you can create something unique or original or what does it contribute to yourself as a photographer that would motivate you to go out and do that I know personally I've come across those scenes and you know if I haven't been to a place I've said well I'm gonna step in and be part of the line and in other locations I've looked at the line and just said I'm out of here you know? uh -huh. I'll go find something different and in this case the discussion I was having um, uh, with these photographers they were going to go teach an, a workshop in Death Valley and one of the leaders was a strong proponent about unique and original creative photography and so I posed the question I was like how do you go to a place like Death Valley with its icon shots of Bad Water, Zabriskie Point, or Dante's View, or the Sand Dunes, and teach your students about creating visions that are just different from the norm. And they said, well, come on down and find out. 
So I did. I tagged along on their workshop for five days, and I went to all these locations. And we arrived at Zabriskie Point, and I've shot it before. And I was like, oh, well, you know what I haven't shot before? The line of photographers. So for me, that became my unique vision of the morning, and it made that experience personally rewarding to me. Mm -hmm. While I was there, we saw a bunch of other workshop groups, including a couple leaders, um, several of them um, very well-known names, so I'm not going to say their names. Um, one of them I met who, who wasn't feeling too well, admittedly said he, he'd been under the weather and his wife was sick. And so he just kind of came up and he was just sitting there while his group was wandering around. And you could tell he's like, I've been here a thousand times. <laughs> he had no motivation for shooting whatsoever. <laughs> and every once in a while he'd pick up his camera and you hear this, click, 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 you know, and he'd file off like a, an HDR bracket or something like that. The other workshop student, that, our teacher that was down there in the line with her students, I mean, she was spending as much time behind her own camera shooting as she was bouncing around to her students. And that's, you know, that seems to be just par for the course as to how these sort of situations go. But, you know. You know, it, Gary, I, I taught a lot of workshops. Yeah. I, uh, I never shot. I left my camera in the bag. When I do workshops, I'm there right. for the students. I'm always kind of a little bit appalled sometimes. And believe me, there were times when we had really good models or really good location. I think, oh, God, I want to get this shot. But for me, it wasn't about me. It was about them. So, Oh, uh, that's a times. whole other webinar. <laughs> yes, that is. Uh, I, d I don't mean to hijack the thread. Yes, but it, it no, sure no, is. No, no, no. Um, I, I saw a, photo, a photographer, and recently, right after reading your post, I tried to go find this guy, and maybe you know who it is. He took pictures of people photographing what was behind him. So he would go to these iconic places and then turn around and photograph it. He had a shot from Machu Picchu uh -huh. that was stunning. There had to be three or 400 people behind him photographing that same scene every time i see machu picchu i think wow you know you get up there but you're all by yourself and you kind of wander around and then i find out oh no no there's like a thousand people a day up on that thing and right. there's, there's uh you, you can't go in if your lens is over four inches something for folks to um if you're listening to understand your lens oh, is really? longer than four inches they call it a professional and you have to pay 300 bucks cash cash huh. to get in so um Oh yeah, they've learned. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's where those little micro four thirds cameras with their good glass. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I've been to the Grand Canyon. I just took my daughter up there, and and for me, the Grand Canyon is the epitome of of something that's so hard to photograph. It's well. Have you been to Zion? Yes. Mm -hmm. To me, Zion would be the epitome of the most difficult thing to photograph in the world. I, I go and I take pictures of trees against the rock, but Zion itself, I don't, I can't even get the shot. Um, I've seen some beautiful shots, but I don't, I don't get it. But the Grand Canyon is you pull the camera up when you lose that, that third dimension, it's gone. And I, I'm standing, but yet I can't, I can't help myself. I stand there and make the photographs. <laughs> You right. Know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm snapping away and I come home and look well, and go, well, okay. <laughs> it's a, uh, it, you know, Zion is ac actually home to one of those absolutely great icon spots that, I mean, people just line up for. And it's, it's the kind of famous shot at the, um, the bridge right there over the Virgin river. Yep. And, I got one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like we kind of, you know, all feel um, obliged to stop there. And that's, uh, again, one of those those choices people need to make in terms of, you know, um, the motivations behind their own photography. Are, are they out there to get something that's personalized and unique? Um, 
and you had mentioned um, the Grand Canyon, which is is very much the same way. It's really easy. You can just walk up to the um, south rim, uh, you know, a hundred yards from a given parking lot, and you can snap away, and you've instantly got your iconic image. And mm -hmm. then you're able to walk away and say, "Well, I there, I've I've got my postcard." Um, the biggest thing I hear is, you know, the the people is like, well, what can you do uh, to create some kind of unique vision? And that's that's what I generally try and say, especially in my workshops or when I'm dealing with presentations or clients, is trying to keep your own unique vision in mind. And sometimes you do walk away with. I, I went there to get this shot. I got that shot. Okay, now I can walk away, and that is that. Um, on the other hand, just being in tune to what's going on around you, and you mentioned looking behind you. You know, I've had even even looking right in front of you. I have been in several instances at some of these great places like the uh, Snake River Overlook in the Grand Tetons or at Mesa Arch in Canyonlands, you know, popular places, both with relatively small areas for photographers to be and very crowded. And in one instance, you know, I, I, it's what was going on behind us. Wow, you got this beautiful icon location, right? right in front of you but spectacular light is happening behind this entire line of photographers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I've, I've got examples of this I use in my presentation I'll be happy to show you um, and, and no one else took a picture of it or they go with such strong expectations of you know this is the trophy shot I need and anything short isn't going to work for me. And I've seen photographers standing there twiddling their thumbs, talking, drinking coffee, while this magnificent light show was going on around them. Oh, I and know. Amazing. they stood there oblivious because it wasn't where they wanted it to be. And they just, they simply weren't photographing. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, what, you I know, wonder it, if they're looking for that shot instead of a shot of nature or something right. else. They're really looking for that one shot. Like, and I think your term trophy was great. Was great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Do you want to share some uh, images with us? Oh, sure. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be just a, a little bit new for me on how to do this. So it's so all I with me. All you all what uh, what uh, computer are you on? Um, meaning um, what operating system? What no, type I mean I'm sorry. Uh, your your screen dimensions. Oh, uh, that's a that's a heck of a good question. Hang on, let me go check out my little screen properties here. Um, I think it's a 1920. Okay, it may it may squish it just a little. Sixteen eighty by ten fifty. Okay, it may squish it a little bit. We'll see what happens here. But I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, I, are you ready for me to bring up your screen? Sure. Okay, I'm going to hit change presenter, and then basically, all all we're looking at is your screen. So basically, you can change pictures on your website and whatever. We're just sharing your screen. All right. Sure. No problem. Here we go and change. Here we go, and it'll take just a second to do it. Nope, do and show my screen. I saw a little button there. I said that, and there we go. And now we nice. have. So you screen. can. See. Oh, I see. It's it's actually it's shrunk it down to fit within mine, so it's still on the on the recording. Excellent. Awesome. Wow, that's that's Great. a that's an absolutely beautiful uh, <laughs> a wallpaper shot there. Where was that? Oh. That is that is half dome looking from the top of Clouds Rest. So oh, yeah, that's right I'll, here, right here in the middle. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now you can see Bridge, right? 
Mm -hmm. All right. So let me see. So if, what we're looking at right here, if you can see, this is a shot of um, uh, Mesa Arch. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the prime examples. And this is something I include just as, as um, you know, a, a beginning of talk on exposure. So you see two exposures. But what people go here for is this classic red light right. on the arch. And, um, you know, I, I've shot here before, and I had gotten my nice little postcard view. And this is one of the things... Um, this is an older shot. It was taken on film way back in the day. And surprisingly, you know, this image was picked up by a number of my agencies and it was shot on 35 millimeter film. And I know they had larger 4x5 film from other big landscape photographers. So I don't know what made them choose mine per se, but that was kind of the shot. And there's a very small area where photographers go to line up and, you know, especially during um, the high tourist season, it can be quite crowded. So Sunset Magazine actually had sent me down to do a, um, an assignment. And for those out of the area, Sunset is a very popular Western regional states travel magazine. One of my favorites. Yep. And they sent me to do an assignment called Three Days in Moab. And so I figured one of the great things I wanted to do was get a shot of the photographers shooting Mace Arch. I wasn't so much interested in Mace Arch as much as the photographers. And we get there this morning and line up, and as I show up just about sunrise, there is an entire line of tripods, an entire line of photographers, not even near their tripods. They're standing standing 15, 20 feet away. You know, they got their tripods and cameras all lined up so when the light became right, they could all run up and start taking pictures. Um, I, dare I call it a lemming action. And <laughs> Well, I can, address I all email to Gary Crab at... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me give you a, a, a different email address for that. Um, <laughs> But so I, I come down with, uh, I've got my own shot and idea in mind, but the light isn't that great. So they're all standing there, probably about 25 people with this line of tripods. And they're all standing there talking, gabbing. There's, there's international tourists. There's people, you know, they're, they're just having a blast socializing and not taking pictures. And I see the sun rising behind me. So here's a nice example. I run up to the top of the arch because while no one was shooting, this is what was happening right in front of them. Wow. And no one was taking a picture. Not one person was taking a picture of this scene because the light wasn't happening on the arch. Wow. That's a beautiful shot. Look at that. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, I, I looked. I literally looked. I'm like, do these people know? And this was not happening behind them. This was happening right in front of them. And that's just gorgeous. Uh, thanks, but because of the clouds that morning, the light never came on the arch. And you know what happened? They all just packed up their cameras and left. I actually had to stop a couple of photographers and say, look, before you guys go, will you please just go take a few shots for me to let me get, you know, because I needed my shot for the magazine. Mm -hmm. And so these, these couple guys said, all right, we'll go take, we'll, we'll pretend we're taking photos. But everyone else missed that shot. <laughs> you know, and so this is eventually the shot that I was able to get for the magazine. Astounding, uh, just astounding. <laughs> but it, you know, everyone I show those earlier shots, they're like, wow, wow, wow. And this is what I call photographer's subject tunnel vision. And I use this as a prime example in my workshops because I say, you know, as photographers, it's our job to, what do we do? 
we photographed light. And when a photographer walks up and they're so stuck in the idea of I'm here to photograph a subject, but they're not thinking about where the light is or what the, the light is doing, you can see the quality of the shot that all those photographers just missed. And then let me go back to another example real quick. So, uh, let me just scoot that around. So my wife and I had been camping on the western side of the Grand Tetons. And we woke up at 3 a.m. during just a, a angry God's thunderstorm. And we packed up our tent amidst the lightning and the rain, and we drove for two and a half hours um, around the Grand Tetons to be on the east side at the Snake River Overlook at sunrise. Because, got of, the, there, because of the storm? Uh, no, just because that was what where I was going. Ah, okay. <laughs> we were just showing up and I figured that was going to be the first thing was to get the sunrise. And, you know, this is one of Ansel Adams' most famous shots. It is probably one of the two really, or two or three really iconic shots in the Tetons that photographers go after. And because we had gotten there so early, we were there, um, you know, there may be five photographers lined up. And as sunrise hour approached, it became so packed that tripod legs were literally interlocked among about 50 photographers lined up on this overview. So on both sides of me, I mean, you could not get through. Jeez. And so we started seeing, you know, the clouds coming up and all the photographers are sitting there. And we get these little peaks of light. And I would literally hear photographers say, you know, standing right next to me, no, 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 the, the light's not on the mountains yet. Okay. Well, my, my old boss, who is a, a fairly famous National Geographic photographer, uh, landscape adventure photographer, um, uh, for those that aren't familiar, uh, his name was Galen Rowell. Yep, and he he used to say something that stuck with me all these years, and you know I helped assist in nearly forty of his workshops, and in all of those workshops, probably the one phrase that stuck with me more than anything was, "If it looks good, shoot it. If it looks better, shoot it again." <laughs> so so here I am. I was like, "Oh, light, shoot it," you know. And this is again back in the film days, and I probably. I'd see a little bit of light, and I'd shoot off half a roll of film. You know, I'd, I'd take a few wide angles, a few telephotos, throw in a vertical. I was all set. People next to me going, no, no, no. Light, no good. So then what I see going on behind me, wow, there's some light happening. Right That's below cool. the sagebrush, cool. literally. Right below the bottom edge of that sagebrush is the parking lot. It's asphalt. But no one was looking over there. They're all staring ahead at the Tetons. Then <laughs> this, these beams of light started going off, and I'm like, this is nuts. I actually had to crawl on my hands and knees underneath my tripod to get to spin my camera around 180 degrees. That's how tight the tripods were. I could wow. not step around either side, and I start going nuts. I'm shooting off rolls, you know, several rolls of film, and all the other photographers, you know, they kind of look behind me, and I'm, I'm mindfully paying attention. No one else is shooting these. Finally, a photographer's wife who's kind of standing off on the sidelines goes, oh, well, <laughs> that's kind of pretty. And she holds up her little tiny point-and-shoot film camera and goes, click. It's the only other person that shot these all morning. Wow. And then I had, wow. I had to climb back under my tripod, and I line up, and then again, oh, 
here's this spray of light. Wow, okay, that looks good. Mantra, I'll shoot it. So again, another whole roll of film, wide angles, telephoto lenses, verticals, you name it. I, I, you know, give me room for a cover. I, I shoot like crazy. And then again, I literally hear verbatim. Photographer, maybe three or four people down, talking to his buddy. Now the light's not on the mountain yet. Well, you know what? The light never got on the mountain that morning. Nope. Nope. And a few people may have taken the shot, but barely any. I mean, I am blasting through a roll of film, and these guys are looking at me like I, I'm just absolutely berserk. So, so this is, you know, I've seen, I've seen this shot, you know, a lot. Yeah, I mean, this shot actually became a cover of the L.L. Bean screensaver. <laughs> go. I've seen this picture a lot, but I've never seen it like yours. Yeah. I've seen it with the light on the mountains. That's cool. But this yeah. is this is really a beautiful photograph, Gary. This is just a stunning photograph. Yeah. If it looks good, shoot it. If it looks better, shoot it again. Yeah, really. You know, I used to say, you know, film is cheap is much cheaper than having to go back. A. Yeah. And now with people doing digital, what's the problem? Yeah. Oh, exactly. And so, you know, there we were. We were in the Tetons for probably three or four days. My wife and I had been there, and you know, I still wanted to get the postcards. You know, I. I my first time in the Grand Tetons, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go. We showed up at sunset. There were maybe four photographers there. This is still shot on film. And just capturing these mountains in a totally different kind of light, you know, it's like they, photographers just had this so serious mindset. This place at this time. That's amazing. Well, with this, yeah. And then eventually I did wind up getting going there and getting the type of shot I wanted. Happened to be there right on the full moon morning. And then finally, so this was like a, a second attempt out of three days. Finally started getting that clear light. But now having the moon in the frame kind of gave it a little bit more original feel to it. You know, something a little bit more unique than just... Now, how many photographers were there when you were doing this shot? It wasn't as bad as it was the first morning. Um, I would still probably say um, there must have been 30 or 40 photographers there. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I was, I just got back um, from going up uh, to Zion and Bryce. Mm -hmm. I, you know, those those places, these western parks, are so gorgeous in the summer, but there's something pretty magical about them in the winter. Uh, I, oh, right. I'm a I, I, I'm a guy who does enjoy winter trees, you know, dead uh -huh. branches. I enjoy that. Um, but the fascinating thing was, no matter where we were, there were very few people. And oh yeah, <laughs> that's kind of cool. So we're at Bryce, and you know the famous, you know the famous shot. Uh, inspiration uh -huh. point, right? Yeah. Well, there's a sign up there, and I had no idea who could have put this sign. It said, Inspiration Point, this path closed. And I thought, well, that that sign is wrong. I mean, I can see the path. It's fine. So I went out there. Nobody else went out the path because, well, there was a sign there. <laughs> I had a lot of fun being out there at this really cool place all by myself and yet still the shot was just like what do i do with this you know it's yeah it's you know we had a pretty good sky pretty good light but it's just um it's the same shot that everybody else did but i shot it i did i, I mean yeah. I did it. and my wife loves it my kids love it so you know well I, winter is a great time to be at some of those places because it is it's it's the off season you know i i went literally uh yosemite is my home park mm -hmm. and i've literally mm -hmm. gone more than a decade and a half without visiting the valley in summer yes it's just just too nuts 
<laughs> that head there in the fall and the winter and the early in the spring and you know it's delightful but still some of the best times and places I've had especially in Grand Canyon I've hit a few spots where I've been at these places all by myself yes and, you know it's if you take a photograph it still can't match it just records what you were seeing but the experience of being at these places by yourself is just so strong we were at we were at two or three different places within bryce and zion and we're the only people there my my but uh, charles and i only yeah. people there not another soul around it was really a a lot of fun um and i and i and i and i was experimenting for myself with um with the, I, I, I love, I, I don't shoot landscape per se, but I like to shoot right. environments and the, the different uh, things uh, about it. And of course, you know, your, your favorite park is Yosemite. For me, uh -huh. it's the Vermilion Cliffs up to Zion and right. west to Colorado. It's Canyonlands, it's Moab, that's those rocks. Uh, I don't care if it's blazing hot summertime or wintertime. I just absolutely love it. Uh, yeah, no, it's my favorite space. They are first. They are beautiful. And in fact, um, you know, I, I just had a cover image used on a, a um, digital magazine that was of that. And, um, you know, I've been to the uh, Coyote. Buttes, which is known as the Wave, and I've been lucky yes. to go there a couple times. Yes. And there are those couple like soft mushroom rocks, and I think they call them the Second Wave or something like that. And for some reason, I've just never been up to them. It's like same light, same same thing. Um, but to have walked away, and let's see, I can actually see if I can find this really quick there's to a, show you the. There's, a, there's a place in Canyonlands called the Maze. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. It's just, I love it. So what I'm bringing up here real quick is um, a collection of images. These are the collections that I send off to my stock agents. Mm -hmm. So on this particular trip, we'd gone off to the wave so that you see here. And so as you see this collection, um, there are some common shots. So like this is probably one of the common shots that people would do with you know a bit of the reflection is like all right yeah I like that um, other other common ones you know people love to do these kind of nice sandstone details and I was like all right I got that I even went so far as to oh <laughs> let me throw some hikers in there because that's what I do I do editorial travel photography yep. and while I was getting there you know so I kind of posed you know here and did did some of my own shots. I did a few little, you know, found these little critters in the uh, little seasonal pools that are out there and spent some time. And, I, you know, I've never seen anyone taking photos of these, but from an editorial standpoint, this is a great thing because here I am, I'm at an iconic location, and now I've got something so that if an editor says, you know, well, we want to see something about any wildlife that's at these places or any life, desert. I, and so I'm going around and I'm getting all these different shots and as I say I always kind of keep my eye out for light as much as the subject mm -hmm. and so yeah. some of these oh. details like you talk about in the rocks are just great and I'm almost afraid to show this because I'm thinking someone else is going to do this but when I got there it's like this was the shot I wound up getting that I was like really happy with and it has been a cover um, that's but I've never seen another one like it that's just beautiful Gary gorgeous gorgeous and everyone else kind of goes and says you know this is this is the spot everyone goes to there have been so many photographers and so to walk away with something that's kind of really original is to me that's that's the great reward of one of these icons it would seem um, to me that it would be a bigger trophy but when we when we depend on other people to set our 
uh, criteria for us, they may not see it as a trophy. They're going to want to see that shot that, that they saw on the calendar. Yeah. Almost like and to prove that you were there kind of thing. That's, that's exactly the case like with one of these places in Arches. And so this is, uh, I was trying to remember, I think it's North Window Arch with turret arch in the background. And people will come and, you know, in front between these two arches is the big parking lot where everyone pulls up. And people run and come through this one area to kind of get this shot because it's been the defining postcard. Sure. And, whoops, sorry. They may, you know, do some little variations on this. But for myself, it's like I, I kind of, like I said, I, I spend watching the light. So I had gotten this shot of turret arch. Um, but what I was doing instead was waiting for just this one moment. And this was the light coming through that north window arch. Wow. <laughs> and I've never seen anyone else have a shot like this. I've never, you know, I've this never place seen has, this. I've never seen this at all. This is amazing. This is a place where, I mean, you know, it's kind of like Muir Woods here in California. It's where people arrive by the busloads, literally yep. arrive yep. by the busloads. And what wound up being, you know, kind of the defining shot, again, was, you know, including some sense, you know, of the, the personal experience. And I find this happens to be quite a lot it is one of those things that makes something more unique and more rewarding for myself you know sometimes we're so dead set as well we can't have a person in our landscape shots so we pull up to the Grand Canyon and you know boom there's there's so much land out there mm -hmm. and we we get these Ooh. beautiful vistas all right that one works <laughs> yeah absolutely you know, a nice little bit of light, the river down there helping define it. And I've got these number of these kind of dramatic shots where, you know, light is coming through. And then someone steps into my photograph and I'm like, ah, dang it. And then I learned, you, you, you know, the old saying about what to do when life hands you lemons? Mm hmm. Uh -huh. Make, yeah. yeah. There you go. Make lemonade. And, you know, the same thing again. Just beautiful, great calendar shots. And then someone else comes in and, you know, it's like, that to me, that's as much. This shot with this guy taking the photo, to me, is just as great uh, as any one of my icon shots um, that's straight there without a person. Well, he's, this, um, one this is the experience of being there. Yeah, and, and this is what we as photographers live for, the moments of being out there, literally on the edge, looking at these great vistas. So this one, to me, I actually personally relate to much more than one of the straight shots. Mm -hmm. I think I've got it here. So another example, which is a little bit more remote, is um, the cliffs at Torah Week. And this is on the North Rim, and it's a 60-mile drive. And everyone goes out there, and for the last, you know, 15, 20 years, the shot has been, got to get that first light on the cliff. Mm -hmm. That's what people would go out there for. They drive, and they say, I want to get, you know, this beautiful shot. But again, you know, it's like, I don't live and die by what someone defines as a postcard shot because what I'm always responding to is what is some light doing in the landscape. And I may be out there, you know, once I've got my little trophy shot, okay, great, I've got it. Put it away. Now let me go find something that other people don't have. Maybe it's a shot of a person. Yeah, but I'm also yeah. looking at, you know, what is the light doing at other times of day? It doesn't have to be a sunrise. And so I wound up going and showing a few of these shots that I had got at sunset, which previous to this, I had never seen a shot at sunset out from Toro Week. 
and I wound up going out there and getting this shot. And now I've seen probably a dozen other really good shots that people are all of a sudden they're staying out there um, because they realize, oh, it's it's not just the postcard. It, it's about the landscape. And when you're concentrating on what the light does in the landscape, um, then it doesn't matter, you know, if you're at a trophy shot. If you've got some great light, you're going to walk away with a great, unique image. And that's probably one of the defining things. And so that's when I just start, you know, I, I always describe myself more as Toucan Sam um, from the old Fruit Loops commercial. You remember what Toucan Sam did? Follow the nose. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so in this case, I'm just replacing nose and Fruit Loops with eyes and light. So wherever the light goes, there goeth my camera lens. Beautiful. Oh, gosh. Beautiful stuff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've always, I've always said you, you cannot photograph the canyon. You can, a photo, you can photograph light in the canyon or events uh -huh. in the canyon. Uh, a friend of mine happened to be up there and caught a thunderstorm in the canyon. Right. That was actually, he could see from the north rim, he could see the south rim. But down in the canyon was a full thunderstorm, lightning, big dark clouds. He It was that low of a storm. Just an incredible photograph. Um, yeah. But uh, this is, this well, is, this is that late, this is what, uh, blue hour, real late? Uh, after this sunset? is actually um, uh, evening light taken from a, a place called Point Sublime on the North Rim. And this mm -hmm. is about 20 miles down a nice little four-wheel drive road. And this was one of the places where um, me and my buddy were out there. We were totally alone. I mean, I don't think there was another human soul within 10 miles of us and wow. that was wow. that was such a nice experience and so you know just to record the kind of quiet magnificent solitude um that it, it becomes a special <laughs> yep. a special yep. memory as as much and if you can get a photograph that's as evocative of those kind of special feelings you know that that's when I feel like I've come home with you know um, something that to me is that's my unique trophy shot you know if, mm -hmm. it, can, if it can evoke a feeling of a place's uh, special grandeur and it doesn't need to be um, necessarily the icon spot because sometimes you know you can generate those but you know, at the Grand Canyon, it, it's it's hard to miss. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is, and you know, you gotta you gotta find your own way in this in this uh, in this crazy world and you, you, photographic world, and you you go out and look for different things to try to make them unique and what have you. But um, but finding shots that mean something to you personally, um, the best thing in the whole world. Right. And, and like I said, you know, I, I have friends that avoid these kind of icon shots because they feel, you know, and, and the common phrase is done to death. And many of them have been <coughs> done to death. But it does not mean you can't walk away with something that's entirely unique. I mean, I've got shots of the Grand Canyon. Um, but for just a second, I want to show you probably one of the, you know, great things. And as I mentioned, my home park is Yosemite. And this right here is, I think it was an 1896 shot by William Henry Jackson. And I had used some of these old historical photos for one of my book projects. But people say, oh, Yosemite, half dome. You know, they'll... they'll kind of avoid it by the play. Like, what can you do with Half Dome that's even been unique? 
and there are places in Yosemite where people line up. This is like the bridge in Zion, but this is the bridge in Yosemite. Yep. I've and, been there. I've been standing there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We all have at one point or another. If we've been to Yosemite, that's one of the places. And you go and you get your shot. But when you can, you know, I, I did this one in direct contrast. So going back, I did a book that was going to be basically a yesterday and today version of California. So this image was in direct contrast to William Henry Jackson's. And it's still just a magnificent vista. This is Glacier Point, and you mm -hmm. can see why people go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a world-class view. Um, and again, just like some of my other thoughts or, or, or shots, you know, it's like I'm, I may be doing some editorial documentation, but when I can, I, I still want to get my own shots of Half Dome that are unique and flavorful. And this is the kind of one shot that everyone goes and gets. It's the nice sunset shot from Glacier Point. It's, it's actually on the state quarter right now, this exact thing. And once you've seen this shot with kind of a, a clear straight sunrise or sunset light going up on the uh, face of Half Dome, you know, four or five times, it's easy to say, been there, done that. And then you might want to skip it and go do something else. This is a middle of the day shot from Olmstead Point. And I've used this as like, well, this is what the tourist drives up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and photographs. From a landscape photographer, we're on the lookout for special light and when special light develops. So if I can see, oh, hey, there's some potential going on here or different times, this was actually an old film night shot. This is the same shot color corrected. <laughs> you know, but you can see how much, how much light is actually coming down in the middle of the night on a moonlit night. Wow. No, this is how it looks pretty. when that, you know, that potential really develops and it, it's just kind of being aware of when can I find those kind of special circumstances that are going to make that subject sing and, and stand out and give you an opportunity? So from this instance, the people up in, in um, Glacier Point, which is almost opposite this point of view, were probably seeing something relatively similar to what I had shown in the first. You know, they're getting a full view face on. Mm -hmm. But adding in some shadow and some contrast, lights against darks, um, that always sort of kind of brings it home. It makes a more dramatic, more unique image. And most photographers aren't aware, you know. And so maybe it's during a storm that you get out and you say, oh, I'm going to wait. And you get that one moment of special light that makes it all worthwhile. Oh, gosh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, and th this is just moments, you know, same evening, different light. No, I saw that. So uh, what I did is I also, for just the thing, is I just throw in just kind of a little, you know, it's like a portrait of a model. You get model, the same model in different light different costumes, different locations, you're not going to wind up with the same photo, even though you're using the same person. That's so true. So, so let me see if I've got here. So here's an example of just half dome, different times, different lighting conditions. You know, I've been there lots of times. Just because it's an icon or a cliche, I'm not going to avoid it when the circumstances are ripe. That would wow. be a disservice to myself as a photographer. Yep. Well, that's, you know, oh, gosh, that's just gorgeous. This, I was actually on a workshop, and I was teaching someone, you know, um, and this was a prime instance of if it looks good, shoot it. If it looks better, shoot again. 
And we saw this light, and we're out in the um, big meadow, and there are probably 20 photographers standing around. And I, I'm sitting there telling this one guy, shoot it. It looks good. And they're all, no, 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 you know, people around us like, no, you want to wait till the light is all the way on the face. I want, well, yeah, but that, that would be boring. <laughs> and you know what? The light never happened on the face. This was as good as it got, but it's that contrast that made it so unique. But it's so unique. Special. And, and, you know, when someone says, oh, no, you've got to wait, it's like, what, there's a rule? Yeah. Oh, I don't do well exactly. with rules, Gary. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's you know I I I may get out I may take just those kind of iconic shots. These are ones I'd seen. These are different ones from Olmstead Point. I've just gotten a, a, a slightly unorganized folder, but this is um this is the shot that was taken. So this is the top of Clouds Rest. This is about a fourteen and a half mile round trip hike to walk up to the top of this mountain. And this is a view of Half Dome that very few people get. It's not an easy hike. No, Clouds Rest is, I, I did Clouds Rest when I was younger. And uh, uh, for yeah, those of it, you who are not familiar, there's not very much air up there. No, and there's this little knife edge ret that's, you know, maybe at one point only about two and a half feet wide. And I always tell people, if you're going up there, make sure you lean to your left because it's only... 450 feet down, whereas if you fall off to the right, you've got uh, nearly 6,000 foot <laughs> yeah. Yeah. fall. But we just sat up there. We got up there at 3 o'clock, and I was like, I, I knew what I was there for. It was the special light, same evening. So this is this was what you saw on the desktop. And wow. Wonderful view. So you had, so, I mean, you didn't wait till dark to come back down from Clouds Rest, did you? Oh, absolutely we did. <laughs> oh, yeah, we yep. definitely hiked down in the dark. And, oh, yeah, one, wow. one point oh, we lost oh. the trails. <laughs> oh, geez. It was fun. It was it was interesting. Yeah, I think we got back to the truck at about 11 o'clock. So it was a long evening. Um, but then, again, you know, I also include, you know, these kind of shots for people that aren't familiar with Half Dome. You know, I like to give them, it's like, here's shots that you may not get to see at all. This is the top of the subdome on the tight, uh, hike up to Half Dome. You can see the cables in the background. Uh, this is the one hike in Yosemite that you're most likely to die doing. And it's a real hoof. It's, it is about a 16-mile hike with more than 8,000 feet of vertical elevation change from start to finish. So you're hiking up nearly a mile and then you're hiking down nearly a mile. Wow. Wow. So th this is as much, this is all part of that one same icon, but it's a completely different view, much more unique. Very few people get to see it in person. And it's a great image from the top looking down at the valley. Wow, look at that. You know, in the in the summertime the valley has its own ecosystem. Oh yeah. It, it's it's nuts. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. I, I, you know, one of the surprising things I also tell people is that the top of Half Dome, which is basically two and a half acres of just granite rock, is a great place for wildlife photography. Because they have marmots and ground squirrels that are fearless and they actually warn you now don't leave your food bags because these guys this was this was like an a, a 28 to 70 lens that's how close I mean these things will literally come right up to your your bag and try and take it right out of your you know nose but <laughs> I think one of the defining shots of this icon on this particular trip was that's that's what it looks like going down the cables jeez so there, you know, Half Dome is an icon, but it doesn't warrant avoiding it because it's the cliche. It doesn't warrant avoiding it because it's done to death. I mean, there you've just seen a great little library of different portraits. It's the, in my mind, that's the same model. 
it is yeah you're right it is a portrait it's um it's a uh, everything from a historical record to a portrait to uh yeah. uh so in, it, what you're saying is and I, and I think i agree instead of ignoring them um work harder mm -hmm. to find something that someone else hasn't done yeah you know uh, it, take the time to to you know Focus on what is attracting your eyes, not necessarily the calendar shot that's been done. You know, maybe that's what you want, but once you get that, that's fine. Put it in your pocket and move on. Don't You don't have to ignore the icon or the shot, but just take the time. Um, you know, I've got, like, um, let's see if I've got it right here. No, I, I don't. Um, you know, I, I was thinking that it's like, you know, we had this thing, um, again, in Death Valley. Um, you know, it, well, he, here's a great example. Um, you know, the racetrack. Mm -hmm. This was one of the cases where how do you go out to the racetrack and find something unique? Because everyone is doing pretty much the same shot. You go out there. And whether or not you get changing light, it's all about the rocks and these moving trips, you know, the trails they leave behind. Yep. Yeah. So it does. It takes some real work to come up with something that is unique or inventive. And even if it isn't, it's still okay. I mean, you don't have to avoid it because it's been done to death. I, you know... I had this one guy, I was shooting this beautiful line of the rocks, and this one photographer came up completely oblivious to me and just cast a shadow. And I had no choice. You know, in this case, I had to make the photograph about him. Otherwise, yeah, I would have cool. lost yeah. that, that one moment. So it, it's not necessarily the photograph I wanted, but it certainly works as something that's different from what most people get out there. And, you know, these kind of trail shots are the details. And I was thinking that one of the things, and let's see if I can find it here. I think I, I, think I put it in. Yeah. One of the shots I put in, no one ever shows the rocks going away. <laughs> I was like, well, why? You know, <laughs> for some reason, everyone wants to put the rocks moving towards the camera. Oh, and so I was like, flower. Um, okay, you know, let's put where the rocks are going. You so know? there's already a little trail in front of them then. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's weird how they work, you know. That's We're still crazy. waiting to figure out how that's done. And this the, this, uh, this looks like mud, but this is quite hard. Yes, yeah. When you get out there, it's, it's, it is, it's very hard surface. And there are actually signs on there. Um, when there's any rain, they, they beg you, please don't go out on the playa when it's when it's been raining or the it's wet because it turns very soft very quick with any bit of moisture. Yep. And then when it freezes, that's what they think provides the the surface on which these rocks move. Uh, unfortunately, last time we were out there, someone had apparently driven out there. So there are a bunch of tire tracks going around. Just, you know. Unbelievable. Some people have no respect. You know? Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, let me um let me share something with you real quick. Sure. I'm going to come back over to my screen here. Um, this particular image that you see in front of you, we were in Maine, and there were a bunch of fall, uh, a lot of fall foliage on the other side of this little right. water mm -hmm. reflecting back in. And I was shooting it, and I was thinking, oh, this is kind of cool, but, you know, it's red tree reflecting back in. This is what happens when you turn around. Yeah. And exactly. That, that really meant something to me. I really enjoyed that photograph. Um, was not what we went to take, but it was what ended up being there. So right, that's 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 the two can sand uh, syndrome. You know, uh, pay attention to what's around you. I, I mean, you don't need to be blinded into this one subject or one particular thought of what you're there to do. I mean, any kind of responsive photographer 
is, is just going to be paying attention to what you know what the light is doing um, the one thing I always say and regardless of it whether it's a cliche or an icon or done to death you know I, I always say a boring subject in great light will always make a better photograph than a great subject in boring light ah very true yeah and true. you know if you can get if you're standing at a great classic icon but the lights just not very special take your snapshot but then go find and photograph whatever the light is doing special and if you need to come back to the an icon shot to get your trophy that's fine you know do it when there's going to be some kind of something that will give it unique or if not once you've got your little trophy shot move on because that's when your personal vision comes out then you're not a lemming anymore oh, then you're doing something that's going to stamp and say this is mine that's good advice that's very good advice gary i'm going to let you uh get back to your day I, All right. I appreciate right, so much uh, coming on and chatting with me here. I'm going to put this up. And uh, again, um, I'm sure everybody who's watching it has gotten uh, a lot of uh, solid information. Uh, go up to enlightphoto.com and your blog link is there. Yep. And right uh, in the top corner. join in with the and join in the conversation. And Gary, thanks again for for coming on with us. And I'll talk to you soon. All right, Don, thank you so much. All Take right. care.